And if you're a note taker, you can write down the title of the message. It's Hope and Hardship. Hope and Hardship will be in Lamentations chapter three. I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna jump in. Can we do that? Y'all ready? Father, we thank you so much uh, for your word, the opportunity to gather. We just even just proclaim right now that this word is alive, that this word was penned by the Holy Spirit. And we just believe that if you put the book of Lamentations, five poems of lamenting, there is a reason that you want us to catch whatever principle it is that you want to speak to us today. We ask that, God, as we spend a few moments here together, that you would that you would give us hope for the hardships that we face. We know that Jesus promised that in this life we would face trial, but to be of good cheer because he has overcome the world. So today we look to you, Jesus. We put our faith, our trust, and our hope in you. Have your way this morning. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Anybody have children in this place? Raise your hand if you have children. I want to see all the parents. Lots of you. Lots of you. Well, if we're, if we're just uh, meeting for the first time, I've got three children uh, under the age of seven. Actually, my seven-year-old turns eight here in just a few short days. And uh, man, I, I love my kids. But every once in a while, as you're raising young kids, you you experience hardship or they experience hardship and it just breaks your heart as a parent. I want to tell you uh, recently a hardship that my little, little Journey Lael experienced. Can I do that? We took the kids to this pumpkin patch and not Vala's, a hidden pumpkin patch that I'm not going to tell you about <laughs> where pumpkins are much cheaper. <laughs> my bank account's looking a little bit better after the going to this pumpkin patch. So we go get pumpkins and, you know, I told you guys the last time I preached that my kids caught the O'Connell sweet tooth, didn't I? Yeah, y'all remember that? I went to Dairy Chef and couldn't deny the ice cream. So while we're getting pumpkins, my kids are already thinking about the dessert that they're going to get when we get home. Well, the night before, their grandma, as kind as she is, decided to bring everybody ice cream. The two boys, they ate it all. They had nothing left. My little Journey Lael ate half of her ice cream and then stored the other half uh, in the freezer. Yeah, she's real smart. <laughs> so when we're talking about the dessert and the treats that we're going to get when we get home, the two boys are, are talking about the fudge bars that they're going to get. Journey's talking about how she wants to finish her ice cream, but then something dawned upon her. She realized in that moment that because she didn't finish all of her ice cream, that she actually wasn't getting as much sugar as the boys got in the last 48 hours. She couldn't, I mean, melt down in the back of the car hardship. We're talking hardship because she couldn't understand why she couldn't eat half of her ice cream and a fudge bar so that it would be fair. Oh, man, it's, it is so, it's very hard, isn't it? This hardship of not getting a fudge bar and me being the sensitive one that I am, I'm like, in, internally, the dialogue that's going on in my mind is like, we got to get it together here. Are you kidding me? Life is not fair, girl. Yeah. <laughs> is anybody with me? And by the way, why are you comparing yourself to your brothers? Are you jealous? Like, I'm just wanting to go off, you know? But it's such a good picture of, of me, <laughs> isn't it? And we fall into the trap of comparing. And it's funny, I'll get back to this hardship a little bit later. It's really not that crazy of a hardship. Let's just be honest. It's really not a hardship at all, especially the type of hardship that some of you may be facing as you come into the room today. It might not be a, a fudge bar, but I do. I know it. I just prayed it. I said that there's some of you that have been recently diagnosed with cancer. Last weekend, you know, somebody walked in wanting to take their life. Thankfully, they gave their life to Jesus and God is moving. But you have to understand that in this life, man, we all experience hardship and trial. Can I get an amen today? Amen. Hardship is an equal opportunity offender. We always say this, you're either in a hardship, 
coming out of one or heading towards one, and I don't like saying that, but that's the reality of this life. Jesus promised that we would go through difficult times. I think the interesting thing is, is as we walk through the difficulty that life brings us, which oftentimes is unfair, just like Journey, it really wasn't fair. She wasn't getting as much as her brothers, but life isn't fair. We walk through things that we will never understand why they happened. Is anybody with me today? But just like Pastor Todd shared last week, we have to come to this realization and this recognition that the result of all the chaos in our world goes all the way back to when sin entered the world. See, if we don't understand that that's why the world is chaotic, we will get stuck in going around the mountain asking why to a question that we may never get the answer to. What I've realized is so often we try to control and we try to prohibit these hardships from coming into our life when really we need to focus on how we respond when the hardship shows up. This is what the book of Lamentations is going to teach us today. These are five poems of lamenting Jeremiah, crying out after the nation of Israel is taken into captivity in Babylon in 586 BC. If you want to go read the facts about what took place, go check out 2 Kings 24 and 25. That's going to give you the facts of what happened. Lamentations is going to give you the emotions of what happened. See, Jeremiah is crying out, and in this particular book, it's raw, it's real, it's authentic. He's asking questions, he's protesting, he's complaining, but he's bringing it to the Lord. The only one that can do anything with the emotion that he's feeling. Isn't it true that in this life, I felt like even this week what the Holy Spirit was speaking to me is he said this, the Holy Spirit spoke this word to me. Maybe this is for me, maybe it'll speak to you. But he said, why are you suppressing instead of expressing? Isn't it true that in this life we face hardship, we face battle, battles, and what most oftentimes we do is we suppress because it feels safe. And expressing it, exposing it, letting it go, bringing it to God or godly counsel feels unsafe. I think it's a trap that the enemy has tricked us to follow in because he recognizes that if we suppress, it just becomes a bunch of baggage that we stroll around. So for most of my life, I walked through life and this was what I was doing. I was suppressing. And right now, you can see that I'm lugging around some luggage. You can see that I'm lugging around some baggage. As a matter of fact, you don't even know what's in here right now. And that's what I realized is that the, the baggage isn't an external thing. You know where the baggage gets trapped? It gets trapped in your heart, in your soul, on the inside. And it's not just a heavy bag that you carry around, but it's a heavy, it's a heavy life that you carry around. You're being weighed down by the issues of life. And it's just a matter of time, like, as I think about this, and we'll get to this in a little bit, but you'll see here some bandages on my baggage. So many people walk into the church, and they're asking God to help them with the bandage, the thing that they use to cover up the root issue. I mean, this is so true. You got people struggling with addiction. You got workaholics, you got people addicted to sex, people that can't get off their phone, busyness. If I'm just really honest, I mean, I reflect on my own life and I've, I've used all of these in one season or another to not have to deal with the real issue going on inside of me. And so as we look at the book of, of Lamentations, I think that they're going to give us a recipe for how to have hope in hardship. Do y'all want to check this out? Let's go to it. Lamentations uh, chapter three. Let's read uh, what Jeremiah has to say here, starting in verse 16. The Bible says this in 16. He has made me chew on gravel. 
So encouraging, Pastor O.C. He has rolled me in dust. Thanks, buddy. Peace has been stripped away. Has anybody felt that in here? And I have forgotten what prosperity is. Verse 18, I cry out, my splendor is gone. Everything I had hoped for from the Lord is lost. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Now, these few verses really represent the tone of the whole book of Lamentations. You're going to see here in a moment that there's a shift that occurs, and we'll get to it, but the reality is, is most of what is written in the book of Lamentations sounds a lot like what I just read. It's lamenting, this, this crying out, this mourning, this expressing instead of suppressing. See, if we're going to have hope in hardship, we need to learn, number one, how to hurt in hardship. We need to know how to cry out to the Lord, pour our heart out, be honest about what's going on. Did I tell you that this was a little bit uncomfortable for me to talk about today? Because all I've really learned to do in my life is rub some dirt on it and keep on going. Come on, PT. Is anybody with me? Man, just suppress and move on, suppress and move on. But the Bible tells us that eventually what's in the heart is going to come out. The Bible says to keep your heart with what? With all diligence. Why? Because it determines the course of your life. So we have to understand that what we put in is eventually going to come out. And we see here that the author here is, is giving us a picture of what it looks like to lament. We have to understand that you have to understand that the Israelites, these people, they're God's chosen people. They were saved from bondage in Egypt and God takes them into the promised land and it's a land flowing with milk and honey and he's with them and his presence is there and he's blessing them and he's with them. And then all of a sudden, they begin worshiping false gods and committing adultery and all of a sudden, God's justice has to fall on these people and as a result, they lose everything that they thought was irre irrevocable that was irrevocably theirs. They, they, they lose it all in this moment, and a lament seemed like the only feasible response. So some of you in here, I just, I wanna, I wanna share with you what a lament is. It's, a, it's an expression of grief. It's mourning or sorrow. A lament allows you and I to face and name our pain. It gives us permission to, protest life's difficulties, process raw emotion, and becomes a place to voice our confusion. It's, it's where we can scream, cry, vent, and plead with God. I wrote this down, that lamenting isn't irre irreverent, it's biblical. Going to God in your grief is an act of faith. It means that you believe he's actually listening. It might be messy and uncomfortable, but it's the first step towards healing. Here's what I wrote down. You need to stop suppressing and start expressing because God can't heal what you refuse to reveal. God can't heal what you refuse to reveal. You got to come to this place where you're saying, God, I'm going to acknowledge that this is in me. I'm going to bring it to you. And so often, isn't it true that we like to bring our emotion and our struggles and our hardship horizontally to our friends, our family, and we need safe spaces. I think Lamentations not only teaches us how to voice our lament to, the God, to God, but also how to hear it from our brothers and sisters. There is a place for that. But let me ask you this question. Have you been bringing your hardship only to your horizontal relationships and refusing to bring it to the only one that can bring peace into your life, to the only one that can really bring healing into your life, I think sometimes there's an imbalance, right? And it almost feels safe to bring it to somebody in the flesh, but we need to bring it to the Lord. We, we need to stop suppressing 
and start expressing. We need to stop repressing it and start releasing it. We need to stop stuffing it and we need to let it go and bring it to God. Is anybody with me today? This is the invitation that I believe God wants to speak to us today because what he's really asking all of us with the hardships that we're facing is how are you going to respond in the midst of the hardship? Here's what I know. For those of us that have a propensity to suppressing rather than expressing, it's just a matter of time before we start seeing some red flags pop up in our life. Can I give you five red flags? There's probably more that I could give you, but this is five red flags that you actually might be suppressing rather than expressing. Number one is you avoid pain and conflict by over-spiritualizing. Avoiding the pain and conflict in your life by over-spiritualizing. Number two, you focus on doing for God rather than being with God. I see a lot of Christians fall into this trap. At times, I even do. Number three, we cover up failure, brokenness, and weakness. Number four, we ignore emotions of anger, sadness, and fear. Number five is we overlook the impact of the past on the present. See, see, we we need to understand that, that God is inviting us into something different. Somebody say something something different. Something different because he wants us to be whole and healthy. He not, he not only wants us to grow into being spiritual giants, but he wants our emotional growth to match our spiritual growth. Why do you think we have so many people in the church that are spiritual giants but emotional infants? What ends up happening is there's an imbalance and what, what it leads to is immaturity. When you're not growing emotionally at the rate that you are spiritually, there's a gap. And this is what, this is what helps us. I mean, this is part of the process. I, I can't give you all the what you need to do this morning, but I hope that what we understand in here today is that the invitation that God is giving to us today is what do we do in our hardship? We're not going to suppress. We're going to express. We're going to learn how to pour our hearts out. You guys remember a couple weeks ago, Denise preached heart check. A lot of the content that was coming out in that particular message was from Fresh Start. Fresh Start is a process One of the parts of the process of Fresh Start is actually pouring your heart out about the offense, the hurt, or the pain that you experienced in your life. I mean, this is part of the healthiness of walking through this with God. Isn't it interesting that the book of Lamentations is written in a form of Hebrew poetry called acrostic? And this is what it is. In the first four books of Lamentations, there's 22, excuse me, not all of them do they have 22 verses, but in the Hebrew alphabet, there's 22 letters. What, he, what this Hebrew poetry is, is each verse begins with the next letter in the Hebrew Bible. Chapter three, the one that we're in, it's every three verses switches to the next letter in the Hebrew Bible. I think it's interesting that the author used this form of poetry to process through grief. Like there's a process A to Z of processing through our grief. I I think it's interesting that that is what God is inviting us into today is sometimes what happens when we experience hardship is we think the process is gonna be linear. We think it's gonna be neat and tidy. Come on, is anybody with me? Sometimes the process is up and down. Go back to uh, the first teaching of the year called worst day of my life from Job chapter one and two. I think there's a principle, there's a formula, a biblical formula for how you and I are to walk through hardship that PT gave us in that message. What did he say? It's from Job one chapter 20. Job's response, and for those of you that are new to the Bible and you don't know Job's story, Job was one of the blessed, one of the most blessed men in all of scripture. But in a moment, he lost everything. Relationships in his family, he loses his business, he loses his home, he loses his animals, he, he loses it all. And Job, chapter one, verse 20, we get a biblical formula on how we are to walk through difficult seasons. It says this, that Job tore his clothes in grief and then fell to his knees and worshiped. In one verse, we get the biblical formula for how you and I are to process through difficult seasons. Here's what it is. You ready for it? 
We're going to weep. We're going to worship. We're going to grieve. We're going to glorify. We're going to hurt. And we're going to hope. And oftentimes, that formula, that, that mechanism, it just depends on the day. But I want you to allow that to be a framework for you in your season of hardship, because here's what oftentimes happens is we camp out in one or the other. So we become a victim. And let me just say this. Some of you are walking through circumstances unspeakable. I can't even imagine walking through them. But here's what I know, that our God is sovereign, that he is with you in it, that oftentimes he wants to take our pain and repurpose our pain for purpose. But what happens is we weep and we weep and we grieve and we grieve and we hurt and we hurt and we never make it over to this part of the process of worshiping and glorifying and hoping. And God wants both to happen. Is anybody with me today? He wants both. But some of us, we just come over here and we're just Mr. Spiritual. I got it all together. You know what I'm talking about? How you doing this Sunday? Oh, highly blessed, highly favored, but my business is falling apart. My marriage is falling apart, but I'm good. We put on the spiritual front, right? We're in here, we're worshiping, and what we're doing is we're suppressing all the hurt, all, all, the, all the emotion that wants to come out through weeping, all the grieving that needs to take place. I believe that this is why we're in this book is because God is trying to give us a picture of what it looks like to have hope in the midst of hardship. If we don't understand this, here's what our life is gonna look like, right? And I, I just, for a second, can I, I wanna open this up and let's just see what's going on in O.C.'s heart. Can we do that? Let's see what's going on in and some hearts in here today. Can we do that? You guys with me still? Wow. We've got some bricks in here. First brick says abandoned. Abandoned. Do you know what the wound of our generation is? It's the father wound. As soon as I said the word abandoned, you immediately thought of how your father abandoned you. Maybe he didn't abandon you physically. He was physically in the home, but he was emotionally distracted. He, he was passive. You, you've experienced abandonment. Abandonment was the issue that you experienced, but because it felt unsafe to actually express that, or maybe you actually even did express it, and somebody said, stop it. Just basically put some dirt on that and keep going. Maybe you did express your pain at one point and somebody stepped on you for it. They held it against you. But we've all in this place can have, have walked through seasons of abandonment, haven't we? How about this one? Anybody experience being betrayed, right? I've experienced some betrayal in my life. I think of, you know, early on in different relationships that I was in where the individuals ended up cheating on me and it just it created this betrayal, this, this wound of betrayal, but, it, but, but not being processed, not being expressed, not being worked through. I ended up suppressing it. Becomes more and more weight. And, and the list goes on and on and on. Has anybody experienced being rejected in here? You've experienced rejected. You, you can kind of see what's happening here through this illustration that what ends up happening is you have to understand this is not an outside thing that's happening. This is what's going on in your heart today. I want us to understand that when these issues aren't processed, when we, when we don't do the heart check, like Denise said a couple weeks ago, what ends up happening is this is weight that we're carrying around in our heart. And you wonder why you can't connect emotionally with anybody. It's because you got a stack of bricks over your heart. You got a wall. Has anybody not feel, not feel valued in, in their life? I remember going to Iowa State and not feeling valued. Put in a visitor's locker room, one of 10 guys with no name on the back of my jersey as a freshman, they put me in the corner as a freshman with a stick and told me to lift. Come on, somebody. You want to talk about feeling not valued? Has anybody experienced that in their own life? How about this? Has anybody experienced being manipulated? Manipulated. 
So the picture is this. When you and I suppress, we end up carrying around this baggage, and this baggage weighs us down. And you and I weren't designed to carry this around, which leads to this. Because you weren't designed to carry around that kind of weight, you have to turn to something to numb the weight, to, to like remind you that the weight really isn't there. And for some of you, you're like actually waking up right now spiritually. Like, like you've, been, you've been in the numbing state. You've been in the denial state. And right now, as a matter of fact, you're being reminded of certain things that happened in your childhood that you've been suppressing for 35 years of your life. And listen, the fruit of your life is a result of what you've been suppressing for 35 years. God came in here today and told me to tell somebody that if you want new fruit, you gotta get to the root. Now, it's gonna start with taking the Band-Aid off. This, the, the, the interesting thing about how the enemy works is he wants to, he wants to layer you with chains. So that addiction, oftentimes that has to be addressed before we can actually get to the root issue. But today is a day where we're gonna, we're gonna strip the Band-Aids off, we're gonna get to the roots, we're gonna be a, a church that's healthy and whole because we learn the spiritual discipline of expressing rather than suppressing. Is anybody with me today? This is how we have hope in our hardship. Now I wanna jump to the second thing that we see here because this is the shift that we, that we see in this particular text that I think is really powerful and I want us to, to understand this because you can imagine that there were probably a lot of questions that lingered for Jeremiah as he was thinking about the state of his current nation. I mean, imagine he's, he's looking at the destruction, the wasteland and the war zone of Jerusalem and he's lamenting and crying out and probably having a hard time to process the reality of the situation that he finds himself in. But then in a sliver, in a moment, there's a shift, and I want you to see this. In verse 21, it says this, yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. We can't move off of this. See, hope was connected to what he's about to share that he remembered. And here's what he remembered. He remembered the faithful love of the Lord never ends and his mercies never cease. He remembered that great is his faithfulness, his mercies begin afresh each morning. He remembered this, that I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance, therefore I will hope in him. He remembered that the Lord is good to those who depend on him, to those who search for him. So hope arised when he remembered who God is. This is why we are freaks about self-feeding. It's why I say this, you gotta stay ready so you ain't gotta get ready. Because when hardship comes knocking on your door, and the enemy pounces on your hardship and brings those lies, I've got the word of God planted in my heart. I've got past experience that I can point to and say, I serve a merciful God. I serve a faithful God. I serve a God that'll never leave me nor forsake me. I serve a God that says that he who began a good work in me will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. You're not gonna take me out, enemy. This is why we need to plant the word of God in our hearts because you don't know when hardship is gonna show up on your doorstep. I wanna say it like this, that we need to rehearse the truth for a resurgence of hope. This is what Jeremiah is doing. He's reminding himself of who God is. The picture that I got here, ooh, in worship, this was the picture that I got. This was not in my notes. I know, I know this is a picture from God for somebody in here today. The 180, the 180 house, the 180 property. Y'all, y'all know what we're talking about? Do you remember those years where that place was flooding? We, were, we went through a season where we couldn't figure it out, but the, the, the space kept flooding. I remember one particular time, 
good friend of my, my, a good friend of mine was overseeing the property and it was a Sunday night, late. And we walked to his house and all of a sudden you see that the basement's flooded. And you can't just let that sit. Why? Because it's gonna decay and destroy everything. And I think that this is even a picture for us. Like, why do we just let it sit? We just ignore it, but it's there. And I'll never forget it. My friend, he had to go get this thing that would like suck all the, 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 the junk, the water, the, just all the mud out to get to the, like, the floor, the foundation, like what is really true about that space. And I feel like this is a picture for us this morning. Like, are you just gonna let it sit? Or are you gonna extract the junk, the water, the mud and get to the foundation, which is the truth of God? See, but this is, this is what happens because we haven't learned this, this, this spiritual discipline of lamenting and bringing it to the Lord. Is, it's like we never can get to the truth. We just get blinded and we get overcome by all the gnarliness, by all the hardship. And now all of a sudden, that's what we see. And that's why I love how Denise will challenge us. She says that, that it's worship that brings things into proper perspective. Uh, might I say that it's as we process the issues of our heart and the issues of life, we start to gain proper perspective. And all of a sudden, you start to get to the foundation of who God really is. Like, this doesn't define my life. This is who God is. Yeah. And now as I begin to worship, I just gain even more altitude and perspective. I think this is why in the midst of this trial, Jeremiah gets to this place of hope, of hope. And it's not just Jeremiah, we see this all throughout scripture. I think for some of us that are being challenged in this particular area today, we, look, we need to look no further than King David himself, who penned many Psalms in the scriptures, and about two thirds of the Psalms that he penned were, were him lamenting, crying out to God, complaint, bringing his complaints to the Lord. Now, what we need to recognize is this was a man after God's own heart. There's such a stark contrast between King David and the king that served before him, King Saul. And I think that's the imagery and the question that I want to ask us today is, which one do you want to be? Because King David understood this discipline of lamenting and, and keeping his heart clean, even through difficult circumstances, even when he missed the mark, he was able to get back on track and finish his race well. But many of us know Saul's story. He had fears in his heart. He had jealousy in his heart. He had all these things going on in his heart. And because he never learned this, this, this processing, this lamenting, this taking his heart before the Lord, we know how his race finished. I think, the, I think God is asking us a question today is like, how do you want to finish your race? Because we have to understand that people, we can teach what we know, but people catch what we carry. What are you carrying? And what you're carrying is contagious. I want to close with this story because I just want you to understand God's heart in all of this. I told you about the meltdown that Journey had. Let me just tell you, the meltdown didn't just happen for five or ten minutes in the car. I mean, this thing continued at the house. She ran into her bedroom, she had tears on her face, and I'm thinking to myself, my goodness, she is distraught over something so minuscule. And I went in there a couple times and tried to have some conversation with her, and it was so interesting because we got to a certain point where I had to go in there and just, because I love her and I want the best for her, I, I had to say to her, Journey, I love you, and, and listen, you are, it's okay for you to, to process this emotion and to be struggling right now. I want you to know that that's safe. You don't, you don't have to hide that in this house. Like there's a safe space for you to feel and to let that stuff out. But I just need, I need you to know that like this attitude, it, it's dishonoring the Lord right now. He, he doesn't want you stuck in jealousy and in comparison. And there's a fun night ahead of us. And if you keep going down this track, I mean, I'm gonna have to discipline you. And as I'm having this conversation, there, there, I can't even explain it, but there was something in my heart that just, that just like, it was like, just, just sit with her for a second. So I get on my knees 
I start rubbing her hair, start looking at her in the eyes. I start asking her even more, just tell me what you're feeling. I wanna understand what's going on in your heart right now. Like, why is this wrecking you so much, girl? Like, this, this isn't where, do you, do you believe that this is, you know, where God wants you to, to camp out? Do you, do you believe that this is where, how he wants you to, do you believe that this is the attitude that he wants you to have? And we're, we're, we're talking through it and she's being really vulnerable and honest about what's going on in her heart. And I just, I stopped her and I looked at her and I said, Journey, I want you to know this. That daddy wants to create a safe space for you to just be honest and raw. I'm not moved at all by what's going on right now. I want you to know that I love you no matter what you're feeling. I love you no matter what's going on in your heart. And as she's processing and getting her emotion out, I asked her, I said, hey, can we, can we pray about this? Is that okay if we, if we begin to pray? And I take like a good solid five minutes. This wasn't a quick moment. And I begin praying for her. And I'm praying and I'm crying out. We finish the prayer and she looks at me and she goes, my brothers can have their fudge bars. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, <laughs> I wasn't waiting for your like approval, but, <laughs> but I love where your heart's at. Now, I was sharing this with PT before we boarded our plane this week. And I, I said, man, parenting's hard. Because so often it's like, I don't want to take that time, right? I got stuff to do. It's been a long day. It's a Sunday. Like, I just want to get on with my night. I don't want to take 15 or 20 minutes to create that moment. But it's interesting because as I've reflected on that moment throughout this week, I felt like God was saying, hello, I'm your heavenly father. And you've believed the lie that I've got so many other issues to solve when I just want to come next to you and get on a knee and hear about what's going on in your life. What's going on in your heart? Like, let's talk about this. This is a safe space to get this thing out. You don't have to carry this by yourself any longer. And I believe that that's what God is saying to us today. I see it in your eyes. God is speaking to some of you. You've been suppressing and you're tired and you're weary. And God is saying, no, no more. Bring it to me. Lay it before me. And the result will be hope in your hardship. Do you receive it today? Father, we thank you so much for this word. We thank you that you're, that you're gentle, you're patient, you're kind. You're with us in the midst of the hardship. And today we even just, we confess that so often we've suppressed rather than expressed. We've, we've neglected pouring our heart out and we're wondering why Toxicity is flowing out of us today, God. We just acknowledge that. But I declare over your people today that they wouldn't feel shame, that they wouldn't feel like you're mad at them, that they would really recognize that in the same way that an earthly father wants to create a safe space for their children, you want to create a safe space for us to process the issues of our heart. So today we take that step, God. We step into it. We say, no longer am I gonna numb, no longer am I gonna put a Band-Aid on it, no longer am I gonna deny. Today I'm gonna acknowledge that I've been suppressing and I'm gonna begin the process of expressing. Holy Spirit, teach us what to do, when to do it, how to do it. Thank you that you are our great counselor, you are with us, and today I pray that you would teach your people to work through this. In Jesus' name.